Okay, so my name is Lee Chantel and thank you for coming today and thank you for people watching at home and I'd also like to thank ICAS and all the organisers for putting on this event. Hope everyone's learned something from it. And um, so um, this today is going to be staging effective events and engaging volunteers workshop. And um, I'll just go through my sort of background and my history first, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty stuff. And I hope you've all got the handouts. Um, if you need any more, grab some on your way out to give to friends or something if you like. And so um, I've had a background in music. I was going to be a rock star on stage, so I released my own CDs and had um, my own um, record label and that in 2001. And um, so I've always been immersed in promotion and um, networking and things like that. I also started to become more involved in the vegan and animal rights scene in about 2005 when I had finished my studies in nutrition, naturopathy and Western herbal medicine and released my first um, recipe calendar. And I started my website vivalavegan.net to pretty much promote my calendar. And um, so since then, the website has become a interactive and a multimedia place for vegans and vegan curious people to find out more information. And I like to think it in a non-confronting and non-judgmental way. And it's, I also focus on a lot of the positive um, aspects of veganism. So um, today, what I'm going to talk about is a not-for-profit environmental group that I run called Green Earth Group back home in Brisbane, Australia, where I live most of the time, and about the festival that I've put on. I've put on two successful festivals in Brisbane. One was called Green Earth Festival, the first one, and then Green Earth Day the next year. Um, we had three to 4,000 people at the first festival in Brisbane, and that was basically just based on um, network and promotion online, in particular Facebook stuff. So, um, that, I, I'm just going to give you the background of Green Earth and the festival, and then we'll go through the handout. Um, so, the idea is with Green Earth Group, I've been to a lot of events that were what I call like preaching to the converted, in particular in the environmental as well as the vegan areas. So, I'd go to a lot of green green events that sold that has sausage sizzles and things like that, which was quite irritating to me. I'd go to a lot of vegan events and they didn't get all the other intersectionality sort of things. So, and also I found that it was just the same people talking about the same things over and over. So what I wanted to do was um, to focus on the mainstream and I wanted to educate the mainstream. And the way that I decided to do this um, was to put on a festival and for it to educate as many of the mainstream as possible, I wanted it to be a really inclusive event. So for me that meant a free event and that meant a family friendly event and also a sober event. So this was um, an event that was open to the public from wherever they came because it's, um, and I understand why people um, charge for events because it is a very expensive venture to put on. But for me, I thought if people didn't have to pay to be there, then we would have a lot more access to a lot more people. And um, so I focused on um, I was just saying, I was talking to um, Jenny and John before and um, we were talking about um, marketing and how people um, want to market things to other people and there's like a little, a little joke in um, the design area when people ask you what your market is and people say, oh, it's everyone, like from, um, you know, as soon as they're born until they're dead, male and female. But that's not a target audience. You need to really sort of focus on the target audience. So um, my focus with the festival was to work on different um, areas of the festival and target those specific areas to other people. So for example, we had a kid zone and that went from 10 to 4 and um, that was there for the family and for, for the kids. We also had face painting. And then we had green cuisine, which was our vegan sort of food area. So that was, you know, focused on the foodies and the vegans and the people who were open to trying new foods. 
Then we had a main stage with performers, and that was performers and also spoken word people. So we had a few quite well-known um, bands, especially locally, and some well-known speed poets and stuff like that. And um, this was this focused on the students and their fan base as well, because some of these people actually have quite a large fan base. And we actually held this event in, it's called the Brisbane City Botanic Gardens. So it's right in the middle of the city. You can get to it from various forms of public transport. So you've got buses, city cats, which is like our ferries, um, train, walking, and cycling as well. And that, I thought that was really important as well, especially from an environmental, um, a predominantly an environmental event that you can get there from public transport. And we also had a lot of information and not-for-profit stores. So people sold merchandise there and their mailing lists are actually quite big as well. So that would bring their, their particular audience to the event. We had a speaker's tent and so people got to speak about various things. So animal rights, vegan issues, social justice issues, intersectionality and um, more specifically environmental issues. We also had a, a video zone and we had an art and a fashion section as well. So um, a few months before we had competitions for these things. So we had people um, do uh, actually put in competition pieces for art, for fashion and um, for video. And in the video zone, the winners of um, the, the best video of the year or whatever, they actually could come for a question and answer and they also got to play their video. And this was targeted pretty much predominantly to students that were in those areas and their family and friends. Um, if you wanted to see more about that, um, if you see greenearthday.net, and there's a lot of photos on that, there's it, the breakdown into all the different things that get involved with that. Um, and maybe what um, we might do is, is, does anyone have an event that they're actually working on at the moment that they want to particular information about anything coming up so it's just pretty general stuff everyone's interested in okay I'll just talk about that um, so um, because it was um, an outdoor event and I'm really big on um, self-education and just planting the seeds for people to make their own decisions for things so one of the things um, that I really liked that we did was we made a lot of signage um, and all recycled materials we used for the signs and we just left them all around the area so people could read quotes, so people could read facts, people could um, draw or whatever they wanted to do and they could just go around so they weren't necessarily stuck in the video zone or stuck in the kids zone, they could just wander around and just learn stuff when they wanted to and I, th and I heard that was really effective. Uh, because this was an outdoor event and we needed marquees and tents and things like that. So I suggest if you've got a really, really tight budget that you work with already existing infrastructure. So the second festival we did, we worked with an overpass. So instead of having to hire um, marquees and tents and that, we could actually use the overpass as our shelter and to put people under that. Um, I have one of my friends, we've worked on events before in the past. He works on um, major music events. Um, Darush and I, we worked together and he was my site, site manager and we worked out on a site map. So we plotted exactly where everything could go. He used the space before so he knew what could go and what couldn't go in certain places. And then we also worked out what we needed. Um, and you, for me, this, this was really good to put everything down. As you can see from um, my handout, I like having lists and I like having things and I can work from those better when I've got a list and I can just tick them off. And um, so we worked out all the things we needed. So I suggest people do that with events as well. So for example, you've got a kid zone, so you need someone in charge of the zone, you need an assistant, you need um, say three different shifts of two plus people to do the face painting, you need someone to organise everyone, make sure everyone's sitting down, just things like that. So you can break it up into each section and then how many people you need for each section. That's the sort of, that's the sort of guide to what you're going to need for people. And um, as we had regular meetings which I strongly suggest people do just to get people involved and be part of it and creating the community as well. Um, 
we had regular meetings, so every two weeks we had a meeting and it was open to the public. So anyone could come, anyone could say what they felt would work and how they would actually um, be able to help the event as well. And um, there's a great story I like to tell that, I, you know, Darisha and I had met and we'd, we'd listed all the things that we needed and it was like our first um, open meeting to the public. And I was sort of freaking out a bit because it looked like there was a lot of things that we had to go through and a lot of people we had to get involved with this. And then, so, one thing I like to do when I have a meeting is we all sit around, like, um, we normally have our meetings at our Loving Hut, our local Loving Hut, it's on the bus, the bus route. <coughs> and um, people can go there and we can support a local vegan business as well with the food that we eat while we're there. And we just set up in a square or a U-shape and we all um, just talk. And I just start off by saying things I'm passionate about and the things I want to get from Green Earth Group. And we just go around the room and everyone else shares that as well. And so at our first meeting, we all went around and we did that. And then by the time the meeting had ended, we had all those boxes ticked all the people that I needed. So it was one of those first signs from the universe we were on the right track, you know, doing the, the best thing. Um, we also had a lot of fundraisers and events before the actual main event, and this was to create the buzz, and this was also for getting people, like their family and friends, to come along, and um, just to, to raise some money as well for the event. And um, we had various events like bake sales, we had pirates and princesses dress ups for the kids. Um, we had uh, like a nutrition event where we showed Dr. Michael Gregor's um, DVDs, we had a Zeitgeist event, um, we had panels of people speaking as well. So there's all these different things and like I was saying before with the different areas, they focused on different people in the community that we could promote and market to as well. Um, we had um, over 50 volunteers, um, maybe up to 100, and um, we created we created this tribe, and I like to call it a tribe. And most of these people have become really close friends of mine. And um, it was through meetings, it was through Facebook, and mostly through word of mouth that we got all these people together, and we got all these people to become involved. Um, and one of the ways, and I always talk about creating tribes, whether it's like with veganism or how music and sport connect people as well, because you know some people just seem to forget why people like sport or why people like music or why people are involved in communities, and it's because you feel like you're part of that. You feel like you're part of that, and that you're not an outsider or something. And it's all about creating, creating that tribe. And for me, that's by empowering others and to getting other people inspired and to getting them um, involved and making and also making sure if these people are volunteers that they're getting looked after as well because there's a lot of people that do things for free all the time and they just kept getting asked for more and more and more, which is hard and that I'm sure a lot of you in the not-for-profit world would know that's just what happens. But you need to be able to give something back to those people as well. So, for example... At the festival, we had volunteer bags, so we had um, lots of people donate things for their bags, and they got you know food vouchers, water, um, discounts for online stuff, magazines, and whatever else they had samples of that they could send us. And we also had people um, give the volunteers food at the event, so in our sort of um, volunteer area, they could get food all day. And we also had an after party as well, so a lot of people really into the social aspects of it, so we encouraged the social things. Um, to, to raise money for the event, um, we put this on for $20,000, and um, you need about 30000 for an outdoor event of, of our sort of size. And so that was pretty much mates' rates, friends, just you know, borrowing everything we could, getting secondhand stuff, like everything, just like the really basic that we could. Um, I put a lot of my own money into it, and we had a lot of um, donations and some large donations. We also had sponsors and we had storeholders as well. Um, we had memberships for Green Earth Group. Um, we also had merchandise, the, fun, the fundraisers and events we had before as well. And on the day, we, we raised a lot of money through raffles and through our face painting book. <clears throat> and to get the word out to people, I used my social media marketing skills, that's what I do for a job, 
and um, we sent out press releases. I have friends in media and politics and um, in music and everything. So just all the friends that I knew in um, positions of influence, I just you know said, look, can you do something about this? Can you help spread the word? And um, also another thing, um, I developed relationships with not only the city council, so the Brisbane City Council, but also other not-for-profits, other environmental groups, other vegan groups. And I think a lot of people forget to do this a lot because they're very focused on what they're doing and what they want to achieve. And sometimes they forget that other people can actually help you and sometimes you need help from outside people. Whether or not you like the group or you agree 100% with what they stand for, even if you'd like the people there, you can really learn a lot from, from other people and especially people that have done these things before. And um, I... Um, just, I just worked with them and I still work with these people today and it's, and it's not only getting people to help you but it's helping helping them as well when they when they need a hand with something. So for example we have a, a, a marquee or a gazebo tent you know and we lend that to other not-for-profits if they want to you know just simple things like that. Um, and there's a quote by John Quincy Adams and it says if your actions inspire others to dream more learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. And I hope by today that we can all become better leaders with what we do. So if everyone can see the handout, um, what, I've, what I've got through here, um, just tried to break it down into sections, and some of them do overlap, um, but pretty much the first one is like goals, aims, target audience, and how to gauge achievements. Um, the second one is like the timeline, so the breakdown of say six months beforehand until the day of the event. Um, then there's what you can do, what you need from others, who and what you need. Then you've got venue transportation, licenses including public liability. And then over the page, go through marketing, promotion, word of mouth, grants, budgets and covering costs, environmental practices and leaving no trace inspiring and leading others to be the change and just basics for working and engaging volunteers. So um, we'll see how we go with time. I don't think we'll be able to go through obviously each of these in depth um, but we'll, we'll just go through these as much as we can. So, if, so this is good if you have an event that you're planning at the moment and you're um, a bit unsure of, of what you want the goals to be or who your target audience is. So for example, if you had the goals and the aims of an event, you could you can write it here. Um, so like for Green Earth Group, that was um, marketing to, um, to the mainstream and it wanted to be a free community event. So they were our main goals and aims and to educate people to what we call a plant-based diet instead of, we don't use the term vegan. Um, and then our, t our target audience um, was, and like I said before, we broke it down into all those, those different areas. So each part of the festival targeted a different, a different audience. And um, you, need to, you need to connect what it is, so your goals and aims, and who it is for. That's, that's the truth. And to create something that's newsworthy and an effective event, you need to have a strong purpose and an aim. And you need to find volunteers, members, and other organisers who actually share these same purposes and principles as you. And I think that's really hard to do sometimes, but once you can get it, like that we did, it, you can really move mountains with that. And you need to set realistic goals um, and how to gauge achievement. So, for example, um, you, you have to work out what an achievement, what it will mean to you once you've done this event or what you can get out of it. So, um, so for example, for me, it was more planting the seeds and educating the mainstream. And um, I've just been in Southeast Asia for six months and I went to a lot of events over there that um, they would go, oh, we're going to have about 200 people at this event and we should have at least 100 vegans by the end of that. And that doesn't really happen. And so I was sort of saying, look, you really need to sort of bring it back quite a bit and just focus on like the basics. And um, if, if you think about, and also I think it's like a, a letting go of attachment to an outcome too. And, but like, you know, for example, if you sign up 50 new members to your not-for-profit, is that, is that a good achievement for you? 
if you um, have more volunteers to help with your regular events that you do, if you actually make money or even just you know cover all your costs. Do you want fame and fortune from this? Or you know, do you want a certain amount of attendees to come? Um, and you, you need to sometimes, like if it's just you and your friends that want to put on an event, you need to be able to work with other groups to either just use their public liability or something like that, um, or you need to create your own. So that's what I did with Green Earth Group because um, a couple of the other Brisbane groups didn't want, didn't want to work with me with this. So I created my own not-for-profit group and learned a hell of a lot in the process. So um, I really didn't know anything about the not-for-profit scene or much about events other than attending them so, um, and promoting them. And so I had to learn from day one, okay, you need this license, which led me to this license, which led me to this, and all these different things. There's so, so much paperwork. Um, can everyone read the timeline? I hope. And I hope everyone can read my writing too, because um, some people complain about it, but I say it's artistic. <laughs> and um, so what you need to do, say six to 12 months beforehand, and honestly you need to allow for at least a year before you do an event. Um, and that's just to, to make sure everything like in your head is placed right for one, and also to, to um, focus on promoting and marketing from certain places and to really get on board with these sort of things. And like I said, creating the tribe around you that can also help these things spread. Um, so you need to work out your purpose and the venue, and you need to be like realistic to what your anticipated audience is. So say for example, this is your first event and it's a really niche sort of market and you think you're going to get a thousand people. Unless you've got a really good team, unless you're really good with marketing, you're probably not going to get that amount of people. So it's probably better to start something small, something indoors that you don't have to pay for, like maybe even a church or something, a lot of those places are free and um, just work, just build on that over time. Um, you need to visit all these sites, like there's so many different sites and you need to think of accessibility for people as well. So um, does it have wheelchair access? Are pets allowed? You know, um, how can people get there? Is it really easy to get there? Does it have to take two trains and three buses to get there? Because probably people won't come. Um, can people park there? Do they have to hire things? Like there's all these all these different things you need to think of, and that comes back to working out what your audience is as well. You need to work out your budget. You need to work out your licensing needs, and you need to organise a website and information packs for people. So we had information packs which you can look on the website too for so for the sponsors, the stall holders, and for volunteers because people want to get involved and they like to know exactly how. And then also, this saves me from everyone sending me an email, oh, how can I get involved? Okay, just look at this link, and that shows you everything. So you're saving time as well for yourself, which is really, really important. Um, I have some great um, web designers that do all my, all my websites, called Design Voodoo, back home. And they make sure, I, I sketch everything up how I want it to do, and they, and they do it, and they do a really good job. And it needs to be really easy to, to look at and to find where things are. So you don't want too many drop down boxes, you don't want too many um, like flash things and that. I actually have little birdies that go and fly through the air. I wanted them to tweet, but I couldn't do that. But at least I got the birds to fly. And, um, and just something that's really easy to, for people to find information on, because you would be surprised how many websites you go to and you go, I don't even know what date this event's on, or where's the actual address, how do I get here? You know, you need all that information. And um, so you need to also be compiling mailing lists and press contacts. So for example, you're doing an environmental festival, so you go through all the local environmental groups or local environmental um, products and businesses and put them all on a mailing list and a database, and then you do the same thing with press contacts. And you need to start regular meetings, and then about three months out, you need to send all this information to potential sponsors. You need to get your entertainment sorted out. You need to start the media and other events and the fundraising. You need to confirm all the sponsors, the entertainment, and you need to organise all your permits. 
about um, a month out, you need to print and distribute um, posters on and offline, and you need to schedule, organise all the, sh the schedules for your entertainers and for your speakers. And they need to, you need, really need to get the people who are going to be at your festival to promote things for themselves too, and promote things for you. So we have little buttons saying, you know, speaking at Green Earth Day, or performing at, or find us at Green Earth Day. And you just encourage everyone to share all the stuff that you have online that you've created. Um, a week before you need to organise all the goods and that for your volunteer bags and just get everything in place. Schedule deliveries and the volunteer timetable and you really have to confirm everything. Like by email, by phone, at least twice confirm everything. Um, you need to probably like a week, a week before the event or even another week before that you need to be organising interviews. So say you've got all the press the week before in the paper or in all the major papers and um, you're having interviews like the day before um, the event to get people there. So um, uh, um, on radio interviews and things like that. Um, you need to organise money for the day. Like you need to get checks done. You need to make sure you've got enough money in the till for people. And make sure that you get, you get enough sleep and you get there on time and you're in a calm mood because that sets the scene really for the whole event. And, um, and I'm a very calm person, not much really phases me, and just by that you set the tone and everyone else is calm and gets things done. You, there'll always be people that freak out, but you just need to be able to handle things properly. Um, you need to run through everything with each coordinator, so I'm talking about all the people that are in charge of all those different areas, so then they can run through things with their, the other people under them and make sure you check everything. And then it's action time right at the end, and that's the time when you get to shine. Um, and then so, if you look through um, who and what you need, um, there's various things you need. So like I said before, the website and the press release, site maps, to things like, you know, you have to um, let the fire and rescue ambulance police and the local hospitals actually know of your event. If something's happening, someone could really get injured at your event and they're like, oh, we didn't know about this event. You need to let people know about these events. You need to give people um, an evacuation plan. You need to have all these things under control. Um, you also need um, a phone to put on these, on these lists, like a, a hotline that people can contact you for. And for example, that came in handy because at our event finished at 8 o'clock. And we had a complaint about 10 minutes to 8 because the music was too loud. So we had to, um, I just said, oh, we're finishing at 8, is that going to be okay? And that was fine. And it's just making sure there's someone there for people to contact so they're not feeling like, oh my god, this music's too much, or all these people are you know, at the front of my house or my area. And um, you just need to like, really be transparent and have that open connection for people. Um, you need to work out what your strengths are and what you're good at and then those things you need to, the things that are lacking in that, you need to find those from other people and that's the trick. Um, there's so, I've listed all the things um, there so hopefully that really helps people with events and um, you could, I'll put this on um, my website for people to download or people watching. Um, that they can download as well um, and there's just many things you have to think about and you just have to make sure all of those things are covered. Um, I'm just going to flick through a few things. The, um, we sort of went over the venue beforehand and transportation and there's many many licenses you're going to have to get from you know just basic like public liability insurance is so expensive nowadays. We had to have like 20 million dollar coverage, Australian dollars, for, for our festival. And we didn't have alcohol, we didn't have fireworks. You know, those, those things would completely bump your prices up even more. And um, just even like little things you might need, like a general purpose for signage out on the street or if you need a street to close for people to come in and bump in and out with their cars. You know, there's so many things, and in particular, if you, if you have food stores selling their food, they need food handling licenses, they need a lot of things, um, temperature gauges, this, that, and everything, um, before they can come. Um, and I think I might talk about 
the environmental um, the environmental stuff because I think it's really important with events and a lot of people don't seem to care about it. Um, and we had because and also in particular because my event was an environmental event, you had to be really transparent and you had to be like really on top of your game because everyone's looking for an excuse to hate something you've done or have complain about something. So the less chance you give them for that the better, you know? And um, so like we were talking about before, the, the venue was really good for public transport. That's your, that's your first thing. Make sure that's okay. Um, put really, really clear directions online, like a link to a Google map for directions. Um, we had, like I had someone call up um, on the day of the event who was trying to get her daughter to go to the event and she wasn't sure what bus to put her on. I said, oh, if you'd like to look on our website and transport, getting there or the transport section. And I said, it's got the bus the bus names and everything there from whatever direction you're coming. So things like that, you know, it was really helpful to her. Um, for me and um, for a lot of, or for maybe half of the environmentalists, um, maybe not even that much, um, we do agree that veganism is the best thing you can do to help the planet. So at a very, very basic level, if you're holding an environmental festival, you can't be selling any animal flesh or animal products at your event. Also for me, that was including um, choose cruelty free products that are things like your bunny symbol here. And so no products would have been tested on animals as well. Um, we, um, that can also, nowadays, um, you know, the palm oil issue. So it's whatever your, whatever you think is the right thing to do. And it's, there's a lot of vegan products that do have palm oil in it as well. So you, I think you need to work that out amongst your volunteers or something, if, that, if that's something you want to stick with. Um, all the signage we use, we salvaged from places we had, um, we call it core flicks, I can't remember what you call it over here, the signage when someone's elected for like local member or something, like corrugated something, corrugated plastic I think you call it, and we had a heap of those, so we just painted over them and decorated the signs. Um, we discourage the use for people to hand out flyers and um, we just said if you, like even just putting up a, a little um, slideshow or something on their, on their computer um, and, and, but we also did have a central table for leaflets if people did want to leave leaflets there. Um, it's, it's really good um, to graph like the power and the generators you need to use and how much energy you're actually using. The second event we had this bicycle powered um, smoothie, it's called smoothie cycle. So you could go on the bicycle and make a smoothie and everyone loves that. And you can actually get higher these massive, like I think it's 10, six to 10 bikes and you hire them from this company and that can actually power your event and you can get people to get on there and, and cycle along and that's really good, get the volunteers involved and people love those sort of things as well so it's always cool. Um, with our water supply we actually had a water um, sponsor and they gave all of our volunteers a water bottle, plastic water bottle each which got refilled throughout the day and we had recycling plants set up and everything as well and they also encouraged people to buy the stainless steel ones and they had a, a filtered water that everyone could just um, refill all throughout the day. Um, we had no soft drinks in cans, um, no plastic and no styrofoam as well and um, that and the soft drinks thing um, I'm really anti um, like big corporations and things like that. This is meant to be a grassroots community event. I don't want people buying Coca-Cola and horrible things like that that can just get down the street. Um, we had, we encouraged people to use biodegradable plates and utensils and we actually had links to these places as well. So it's all well and good to say, we want you to do this, this and this, but if you can't give them an alternative or a place they can actually go to buy, then um, there's probably gonna be less people that will actually um, pay attention to that. And like I said, we had these bins on site that were like recycle or waste bins and we had proper signage that we had done and we said what goes into that as well. So say, for
for example, some people get to a bin and they're like, oh, oh my god, is this recycled or is it not? I'm not sure, I'm really confused. So we had little um, signs like saying these are the exact things that go into this bin, these are the things that go into that bin. And we also had people picking up um, rubbish throughout the day and just making sure that we didn't leave anything there. Um, another point of contention for a few people is balloons because a lot of people want to decorate their store, make it look pretty, and I bet it's really, really bad for the environment and for animal friends. There are some balloons I have heard about that do um, degrade, but I think they're quite expensive from back home anyway. Um, and we encourage waste minimization as much as we could. And we had like those facts I was saying before, we had a lot of environmental and vegan facts. So there was a lot of reasons why we were doing these things throughout the day. Um, all the the posters and the um, postcards and things that we sent out all were, were displayed. They were all from an eco printer, so it was 100% recycled paper and we didn't use any gloss or anything like that. We also had downloadable maps and schedules online. We didn't give out any schedules, we just had them printed in one spot. Out. We had one major area that had all the schedules and then we had each area just like on the back of a kitchen door. Some of them were written like the schedules. Um, and I think all those things are really important, especially going forward. Um, and then I think I might talk about grants, budgets and covering costs. So to put on an event, like we've heard this weekend, sorry. Oh, <clears throat> before you move on, when you said that you had a thing about like explaining the vegan, like why we're doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. where, how did you have that? So there was there were signs up everywhere. So we had like either those poor flutes, or we had like s someone had just re um, redid their kitchen. So we had all these benches and doors and everything. We just like wrote facts on them. So say for example, I drew a tree on one, and we listed a few environmental facts on that. Or people wrote quotes from environmental people, just like um, just really sort of. Um, more educational tools that people can just read themselves. It's not sort of in their face, but and they were all really bright and colourful, and, and it was done from more recycled stuff as well. And those were just scattered throughout. The yeah, area. just scattered. So I'm talking. This is a massive park, and we yeah. had all these different areas, and so it wasn't just like, oh, you're all contained in this square. Yeah. It was like you know you had the video zone here, kids zone here, the stage there. Like you could zigzag in and out. The kids zone was in a different area actually as well, so that closed at four, and then everything else still continued till eight. So throughout that whole area, we had all the signs placed. In particular areas, we wanted people to sort of go to as well, say like the speaker's tent. Okay. So that's what we did with that. Did anyone else have any questions about that? Oh, uh, it was about something else. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering when you, uh, you decided to use the term plant-based. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, was that because people have like quite negative associations with veganism? Um, I, I do think people do in general, yes. Um, but because this was an environmentally focused um, um, group, like yeah, we promote veganism through the whole thing. But for the mainstream, who is my target audience, they are more receptive to the term plant-based than they are to the term vegan or even vegetarian. And um, so that's what we said. But then everything on our information packs, it was things have to be vegan. Vegan means rah, 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 rah. For more information, see this. And um, that we, had, we even had vegan police on the day that went around and just made sure everyone had things that, you know, were, were vegan. Like we found there was some felt there and we had and someone found coke and um and there was something else oh bone char in um a, just like a, a orangutan um organization they were just selling cups to raise money and there's bone char in it they didn't know we didn't know like no one knew um but just little things like that that people aren't necessarily aware of um yeah so did you with your vegan police did you uh, did you inspect the guests as well as the vendors? But yes, no, no. It was just... Because I was just thinking that that might be kind of a cool thing to be able yeah. just to point out to someone, did you know that, that this happened in the processing of your... Uh, mm -hmm. that might be no, we didn't, no. Um, I, the people that were chosen for vegan police were for a reason because 
they're quite intense. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I would have encouraged them <laughs> to have too much interaction with the public. <laughs> so um, they like they literally are vegan police in life in their life. So um, they I knew that their skills, I use their skills to, you know, and they're a part of it. But um, for That's them, a great idea, though, for the vendors, yeah. isn't it, ahead of time? And the vendors knew, like, they've read the, it, and, and they've all signed this, too, keep in mind. So I said, this is this is how it goes, this is what you can sell, this is what you can't sell. They had all signed it. So if there was an issue, we said, you have signed and agreed to this. If you don't want to remove that, then we're going to ask you to leave. And that didn't have to happen, but we could have, we could have done that. What does bump in and out mean? Oh, so maybe not a term you use here, but it's when you you bring in your stuff to set it up. Oh, okay. So, so well, coming, dropping, in, dropping. What do you call it? Or loading and loading. Yeah, loading in and out is probably a better term. But yeah, um, so you have to, and that has to be something that you have to organise as well. Can you? Because we set up on the Friday, all day Friday, and it was an all day Saturday event, and then we sort of packed up mostly Saturday night, and then someone's the Sunday. Um, and so people could bump in after a certain time Friday afternoon, and then early Saturday morning. So some people did did either of those, and then you have to, because you know we weren't allowed to park on the grass was one thing, and then people had to go from there to here. So how are we going to do that? We had little buggies, and we had some. Um, board set up in certain areas where you had to sort of come onto the grass a bit, but um, yeah, it's just just like um, schedules for everyone. It was intense, really, <laughs> with a lot of it. And then you have people like volunteers in charge of those sections as well, just to make take, ticking everyone off. And the park actually asked for um, model make and um, registration of all cars as well. So we had to have that beforehand. We had to check that. We had to give them. A, like a just a little sign to put on their car that they were okay to park there for an hour or something while they were bumping in and out. Because it was very strict, the, the park was very strict, so we had to follow a lot of a lot of rules for that. And also, there was an event before that had had caused a lot of destruction to the park, and um, so they were they'd heightened quite a few, and they were called they were an environmental event as well. So. They were sort of a bit wary of another environmental event coming, so so we just went out of our way to like really um, make sure they were comfortable in every step of the way, you know. <laughs> um, so um, how are we over time? I might. Did anyone want me to go through marketing and promotion or anything like that, or do you want me to do more volunteer sort of stuff? The marketing? Okay, so um, the marketing stuff, so that, that's one of my favourite topics. And um, you can, and also like I film all my um, talks that I give and you can see them on my um, Viva La Vegan YouTube channel. And there's a lot of other talks about a promotion online and in particular promoting veganism, if you, if you want to look in the future. Um, so, you, like marketing promotion, like I said before, find out your target audience. That's pretty simple, but so many people don't do it. And then work out the terms you're going to use, like what you asked before, why I use plant-based versus vegan. And um, you know, you, also another thing is to identify those people that really work at making ideas spread. So the people like whether they're really good bloggers, whether they're really well known in um, in the community, you need to find these people that can really help spread the message. <laughs> Um, earlier you said, you know, your, your target audience can't be like everybody, mm -hmm. but how, how would you figure out something like about like veganism? Like how would you create different target audiences based on, you know, if you would be okay with anybody and everybody doing it? Mm -hmm. um, well, you could say, for example, um, with Green Earth Group, now we do a lot of um, smaller events. So say we do letter writing events every second every second month, so that's targeted to people who are interested in letter writing. Um, we do a lot of, I'm, I'm personally not into the social like potlucky type things, but a lot of people are. So we do potlucks every month, one's over the north side, one's the south side. Um, so that's the social sort of stuff that people like. And, it, and it's also educate, uh, like getting people um, in, like to get to know each other and the whole tribe thing as well. 
Um, we also do outreach, so handing out leaflets and things like that. Um, so that's pretty, that's not really, you don't have much of a target audience with that one at all. And we do video viewings and we do that at a, 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 our um, vegan like uh, store. So they have, they sell like Food Fight or somewhere like that. Um, they sell all vegan products. They also just open the cafe. So we use that space mm -hmm. for videos. Um, so it's those things it's just sort of breaking it up into certain things that I know different people like to do or would be more interested in than others. So it's an interest based. Yeah, I would say I think yeah. that helps a bit more with yeah. the target audience for veganism because there's so many different things people like to do and, and actually one of our members is um um training to climb Kilimanjaro in Africa. Also you're, like you know, I, I try to break everything down and then focus on those types of people in various ways on in one group. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like with Viva La Vegan, I have um, various uh, writers. So, Mondays is health, Tuesdays is environment, Wednesdays is animals, Thursdays is fitness. So, through that, you, I focus on all those different areas and I have really good writers that contribute stuff. Carol Glasses has contributed some stuff, and um, in particular on the feminist stuff. And um, you know, because um, my a lot of my audience is quite open to a lot of different things. They're not just like health vegans, or they're not just you know um, interested in fitness sort of stuff. So they're um, a bit more open to those sort of things because we cover everything. So that's what that's what I suggest. Um, are we talking about anything in particular? Like, did you I was just to... like, if I was thinking. I know, like my sociologist brain, like based on like demographic mm -hmm. information, which didn't seem that helpful to me. Um, like you know, these people between these ages of this like class or whatever. But I think yeah. that interest um, seems to be like a much more um, like productive way of like targeting it to people. Yeah, definitely. And then you know, also like another thing with like what I've spoken about with the volunteers is like listen to what people are saying and actually like ask and actually listen to what they're saying. And then if someone, you know, we have members that have kids and they live in the north side, so they want more family friendly stuff over at the north side. So it's just finding out your, once you've developed that call, like we have a really good volunteer base, then you find out what they want, rather than maybe um, like what you think people would want. Yeah. yeah. I hope that helps. Did you make any attempt to, to try and capture names at the event? Um, we yeah we had a mailing list so we had a merch store and the volunteer area so we got people to sign up to the mailing list but we had a pretty big mailing list before anyway but yeah we still got quite a few we still got quite a few members on the day yeah and all the all the volunteers are on the mailing list all the sponsors storeholders the performers so. but yeah the mailing list is a really good way to to get to people like email mailing list. Um, so for the marketing and promotion, was there anything in particular like you had a question with in regards to oh, marketing no. or? No. Yeah, okay. So for me, because I do online stuff, that's my passion. So like um, I do Facebook, YouTube, um, Google Plus and Twitter for myself and for other people, uh, for clients, but I also um, do like Pinterest and um, various various other ones. So um, actually I was thinking, um, yeah, well, I'm South African and there's, only, and there's I mean, there are a lot of uh, people who don't have internet access. Mm. It, I don't know if you have any experience in sort of other forms of marketing. Or... Well, yeah, definitely because, so our volunteer base was from people that were still in school to grandmothers. So we had like quite a large section and some people um, didn't, couldn't go online and see the update. So they came to the meetings. So that's that sort of helped um, with the meetings. And we also, if you have a look on there, we've got like a street team and an, and an online team. And in, in veganism in particular, people say, oh, you've got to, you should only do stuff in person or, you know, online's better, but, you know, you should be able to use everything at your disposal. And so like our street team, we, we did posters and postcards and stickers and things like that. So it was people on the ground. And this is coming from a, a music marketing thing as well, where you have your fans go out and they promote their stuff for you, you give them a free ticket to show or a CD or something. So that's, it's similar using, using that sort of online street based team of people that want to help you out and you give them, you know, um, meal vouchers or something. Um, 
but yeah, definitely. And we and I did a lot of um, media and, and marketing, like we did, like because of our, we had an article about our um, fashion competition. So the competition winner, she made this. Um, uh, she, she was a musician as well, and she made this this skirt and this dress piece that were made from. Um, I think it was bamboo or something, I can't remember what it was made for, but it was like this massive um, audio visual sort of thing because she had um, a projector that projected all these images onto this dress that lit up wow. and it was just like like really amazing <laughs> and um, so she won the competition and we had a photo shoot with her and myself and um, some like volunteers who done modeling and that in the past so we had like really good because of that that was one and then also because it was a not-for-profit thing and um, like people like local news like a lot of the local um, papers or that they really like local news but also um, another thing I would suggest like um, at your workplace, at your school, um, like the sociology department, you you know, get, say, look, I've got this event coming up, I'd really like for you to put it up on the brochure on your events list, on your mailing list. Like, there's so many ways that you can actually get get the word out to people. It's just, um, just um, really thinking outside the square, you know. Um, and so, for, and also, like, another thing um, for me that is, like, it's a social media thing, you need to be engaging people because from if you think back 20 years to how media and marketing was it was like the um, the customer prom promoted something to the consumer that was it just one way one way marketing but now it's all about the two way exchange what have you got that I want what content have you got that I would be interested in that I'm going to share for you because I like you so it's all about creating that content and um, engaging others and not just promoting. So, you, and it's tricky, it's really tricky. And like when I have new clients with social media, I'm like, this is a six month thing. You have to allow six months for, to generate the, the fan base, to, for people to go, oh, I really like getting environmental um, messages from this person because they're really on top of it all the time. Well, I really like all these articles I get from Viva La Vegan because there's all these articles and the videos and the blogs and podcasts and all right. So it's just developing that over time. And with an event, that's why I said allow 12 months beforehand so you can start doing those things. And I'm talking, you know, you, you know you're getting one band in particular, so you share their music every month. Like once a month you share their, 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 their videos on YouTube or something. Like there's always content that you can get to provide for people to give them something. And then you're also helping the people that are helping you out at your festivals as well. Um, and just all the all the different ones I've listed there, like just basic basic things, and even that's for promoting veganism. Like you can just change your email signature to say, like um, Green Earth um, Festival's coming up on this date, see you there. Or you know, I know friends of mine that are vegans watch Earthlings. Here's the link. You know, it's not in your face. It's not too much. But every time you send an email, someone's going to read that. Um, that I think that's really good. And also. Um, at the time of the festival, so this is 2010 was our first festival, 2011 was the second one, and um, Facebook was completely different. So now you sort of, on Facebook you really have to pay to, to get your stuff noticed a lot, especially for, for brands and for pages, but then you didn't really have to as much. So it's sort of changed a bit now, but, um, but um, I hope you got something out of the brochure. And all, um, if you have a look, there's vivalavegan.net, greenearthgroup.org, and my like, writing and music, leashontel.com. So if you have any questions, there's contacts on all of those, and it'll go straight to me. And um, I just, you know, it, I think like with anything, you just have to lead by example and show people how easy it is to be vegan, how easy it is to organize something properly, and um, just be transparent and just like really encourage people to get involved with things. And um, I'll just go through a couple of things quickly. Um, I was going to say, people really want to help out, people really want to be involved, you just need to show them how to get involved. Sometimes that's just like something to download the information pack for the volunteers. Um, sometimes that's leading by example. Some people need a lot more guidance than other people, so just keep these things in mind, especially when people are maybe younger. Um, 
and um, you, you know, try not to to make negativity thrive because it's really easy. There's always going to be issues. Everyone's doing it for free, um, but don't let that happen. You know, obviously, if someone has an issue, take that on board and be really serious about it. But just try and promote the positive. Try and encourage everyone, no matter where they are in life, what their skills are, class issues, whatever, that everyone is on the same page. Every single person can bring something to the table that is valued as much as someone else. And um, I think, I'll just, I just might end with a quote by Maya Angelou, and it <coughs> says, um, people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So just try and keep those things in mind. Thank you very much for coming.